Hey everyone, Kyle here. Just got back from NetApp Insight 2023 in Las Vegas. The whole event was around turning disruption into opportunity by taking the time to make your data infrastructure intelligent wherever it is located. Whether that's on-prem, whether that's in the cloud, NetApp are providing you with a consistent and standardized enterprise storage platform that allows you to deliver upon all of those outcomes. One of the key drivers for the event, which is no surprise to anybody, is AI. So let's dive into what was announced on day one and some of the background around why this is so important. Day one was kicked off by George Curian. He was sharing with us the challenges that are happening in the market, which to no surprise were all the things we were expecting to hear. These were increasing cyber threats, talent shortages, thinking about how um, complex cloud has now become and how uh, operational complexity exists in everything that we now deliver. He then went on to talk about how we can drive data-driven and AI-ready enterprises because that is extremely important based on the data that NetApp have been uh, analyzing. They believe that the data-driven AI-ready enterprise will be outperforming the laggards by at least 20 to 30% over the next coming years. Now, George talked about the three principles that NetApp are following to help organizations to be a data-driven, AI-ready enterprise. And that was looking at creating a cohesive data strategy across your entire organization. The key thing here is removing those silos, bringing everybody on the journey and understanding which teams you have in your organization that utilize data sets. But then more importantly, what data do you actually have and how can you then monetize that data or use that data to your advantage? Secondly was then to treat data as a product, right? Data is the new oil. We need to make sure that we are getting the most out of the data we have available to ourselves to drive the best outcome for our organizations. If we embed that into all of the internal and external products that we develop as organizations, this will allow us to increase our revenue or increase our operational um, profitability. Now, the third one was around creating a modern data architecture. Now, this doesn't mean go away and replace your entire stack from end to end. What NetApp are talking about here is designing to a principle whereby you have a consistent data platform to be able to get access to all of your data, whether that is structured, unstructured, file, object, block, and be able to get the insights into that in a consistent manner. So we had uh, a very interesting conversation on stage on day one around AI, and AI being a major disruptor to everything that we do within the industry. Now, to give a bit of a, a data set behind this, Goldman Sachs outlined that generative AI alone could drive 7% increase in global GDP and increase productivity by 1.5 percentage points over a 10-year period. Now, if we just put that into perspective, that is why a lot of the vendors that we're seeing right now are talking about AI. The potential opportunity for every organization to become more productive, to drive new revenue streams, to get better insights into data, is going to be one of the hot topics for 2023, 2024, and beyond. Now, to capitalize on this NetApp, uh, brought Dr. Fei-Fei Lee to stage. So uh, Dr. Lee is a academic from um, Stanford University in the US. She um, helps organizations understand the complexities of machine learning and AI. Her background was actually um, leading the ImageNet project in 2007, where they actually managed to revolutionize the way that we look at machine learning today. Um, she also helps governments to understand how they can put um, policies in place to protect human agency. Um, and she believes that we are currently in a special inflection moment, especially with the awakening uh, view of AI in the public domain, thanks to the likes of ChatGPT. Her final words on stage, kind of not to go into it too much, was that she doesn't want people to think about AI as a subject. What she wants everyone to think about AI as is a augmentation to human um, interaction or humanity as itself. By doing this, it does not take away the human agency that we have. So to simplify that really down, what she's really saying there is, is that how do we use AI to make ourselves more productive than we have ever been before? How to get better insights into data than we've ever had before? That's what she's focusing on there, not focusing on the concepts around the scaremongering you see in the market around replacing jobs and also uh, making people redundant and all those kind of things. 
The second guest on stage was actually um, George Courier's brother, so Thomas. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know, Thomas actually works as the CEO of Google Cloud. And he was having a great conversation on stage with his brother, talking about the advancements of AI from a Google Cloud perspective. And the piece I want to pick up on here is the Vertex AI platform on Google Cloud Platform. This allows you to create a VPC or a virtual private cloud instance of Vertex AI, which has the foundational models built in. It has the frameworks around controls to make sure that you are delivering AI in a responsible manner. But most importantly, integrated with NetApp, you can uh, net up volumes. You can basically get uh, conversational speech into your unstructured data. Now there's a nice demo on that, which I'll uh, upload here. I'm going to apologize for the, day, the quality. I was sat a few rows back as this was being recorded. I'm to show you all the incredible things you can do today with Vertex AI and Meta Volumes. So let's pick a volume and get started. All right, up in the corner here, I see my volume. I see the internal IP address that it has and that it's an NFS share. Uh, it has some folders on it, a um, bunch of files there, basically unstructured data. Now, this is a demo about the generative AI capabilities of Vertex AI when mixed with meta volumes. So let's look at a use case that's simple but real world. Let's imagine that we work at the marketing department of an enterprise company. We were just tasked with creating a product landing page that's supposed to be ready yesterday. Now, um, we can have a look at all of the data that we have here and try and read through all of them, but luckily we have an AI that can sift through all of our data and find the relevant things. So let's ask Vertex AI about this topic here. Tell me about Google Cloud Meta Volumes. The product page is about Meta volumes, and almost instantly Vertex AI finds all the relevant files that you can see down here. It generated a summary based on the topic on our private data, not publicly available information, and it even told us which pages it used to generate its responses. In addition to that, it's giving me key insights of each relevant file, and with a click or a prompt, I can even generate some more. Like, I want to see the summary of all the relevant files here. Or tell me which people are mentioned within these files. This is all possible by vectorizing our unstructured data that's sitting on meta volumes. And in this case, we have both the data and the vector database indices on the volume itself, ensuring privacy for our data in the cloud. Now, back to our goal here. Um, we could go ahead and generate some more information with prompts, or we could read all of these files and try to generate the product page, but we could also just chat with our data. So let's do that. Cool. Let's open up a chat here. I've uh, created some suggestions just to get the conversation going. So I'm going to ask it first to give me two-line summary of Google Cloud Ad volumes that I can use on a web page. Instantly replies, great, that looks good. Uh, let's do some more. What are the key features of Google Cloud Meta Volumes? Yep, took a second. Key benefits, these are all typical things you would find on a product landing page. And the last one, what are the top five reasons to use Google Cloud Meta Volumes? Awesome. So, we are getting all of these responses from the AI, uh, but I want to pull it all together with some code. So let's ask Vertex AI if it can create that page for me. Can you, can you create an HTML product page with your responses? Cool. Uh, so, it's going to be pretty boring if I don't have an image. So, so let's use the Vertex AI Vision API to generate an image. And I'll, I'll give it a prompt here. Let's give it the prompt cloud, let's say cloud data storage artwork. Okay. 
Cool, the HTML is back. I can have a look at that. Yeah, it's using all of the things that I asked for, key benefits, top five reasons, great. And it's generated an image for me. That looks cool. Um, I want to add that image somewhere in here. So I'll add it after the first headline there. So I'll ask Vertex AI if you can do that for me. Can you add the generated image below the first headline in the page? Okay. Now, when working with code, you can both use the text model or the code chat model. It really just depends on the complexity of what you're working with. So once it generates that, I will see if it works. Yep, look at that. It's added the image file right after the first headline. <coughs> but this is live, so uh, bear with me. Uh, let's save this response to a file and then see what it looks like. Boom. Is that just like magic? That's pretty amazing. What we've seen here, what we've seen here is, you know, the power of Vertex AI with NetApp volumes. We've seen vector embedding in search, conversational large language models, image generation, code generation, all on our unstructured data right on top of NetApp volumes. So another guest we had on stage at NetApp Insight was Director Jen Easterly from CESA. Now, a lot of us will probably be thinking, well, who, who is this, right? Especially from the UK market. Now, she is an individual that is helping organizations to drive responsible use of AI. She's working for a federal part of the US government uh, and providing access and intelligence into the various bodies, ensuring that we can drive AI responsibly across our public and private sectors. Um, she's not just working with the US government, though. So after NetApp Insight, she was flying over to the UK to work with the UK government. And just recently, actually, I think it was yesterday, and I'll post a link to it, was um, the release of the AI report that Rishi Sunak has, uh, has, has now made available for us all to read, which talks about how we should be looking to face the utilization of AI and how policy should be there to help drive the adoption, not the hindrance of AI. Um, the other things that, that kind of Jen kind of covered on stage was that she wanted everybody to think about how uh, public and private entities can collaborate closer together on the use of AI, because without this, it's going to fail. And she used a really interesting um, story that uh, it took 20 years in the US to get a seatbelt law passed through. All right, so let's just think about that time frame just to get a seatbelt law passed through, which is a pretty um, evidential proof that you can save people's lives by wearing a seatbelt. Um, AI can't wait 20 years for all of us, including government, to make decisions on what is and is not a responsible use case and how do we protect ourselves and individuals from AI. So there's a very clear directive there from a lot of the organizations that we need to get closer together to drive that responsible use of AI with or without policy from government. Now, one of the really interesting things I found on the day, um, being an avid movie and TV show watcher, um, was the wetter effects information that was shared. So wetter effects, for all of those who, that do not know, ultimately um, create uh, visual effects for a lot of the mainstream movies that we see out, like Avatar and Gardens of the Galaxy, Stranger Things, all that kind of stuff. Now, to put something into a really good perspective, Avatar, the first movie, used around one petabyte worth of data. Can anyone think of how much data the second movie uh, generated for visual effect? 23 petabytes. Now, 23 petabytes of visual effect data for a single movie. And if you're an organization like, like Weta that is ultimately working on lots of campaigns at a single time, your demand on your, your data pipeline and your storage platform is quite intensive. And this is where um, the WetterFX went on to basically outline that having access to the NetApp ecosystem and NetApp platform allows them to deliver scalable and, and efficient storage on-prem and any of the clouds of choice across Azure, AWS, and GCP, 
delivering the most flexible choice depending on where they need that data locality to be as well. So if we tie that back to the messaging, so as a closing remark from day one, was that NetApp wanted to focus on creating and building a unified, integrated data architecture. Now, obviously, this is going to look to remove silos and to allow you to become more agile as an organization with your data management. But NetApp also um, want you to look at using uh, their single architecture. What is this? Ultimately, it is ONTAP, right? The single OS across all of their storage platform, fronted by their unified management and observability suite. All of this feeding into the ecosystem of AI and how you utilize your data across any of the locations, the three clouds are on-prem, is there to give you the biggest agility and flexibility you need as an organization. So day two kicked off with um, NBC's Mario Armstrong. Now, for any of you that have never seen Mario before, because I hadn't until this event, he is high energy. He is full on. He is jumping around the stage, running like a madman, driving people to get engaged so early in the morning. And especially on a day two of an event for those that have been out drinking the night before and having a good time, uh, are definitely getting pulled into his high energy and positivity. Once uh, Mario had done that and got everyone kind of uh, uh, wide awake and engaged, uh, we had um, Harv Bella and Haiyan Song join stage. So Harv is the Chief Product Officer and Haiyan is the EVP and General Manager for Cloud Operations. Now they hit home all of the uh, announcements or uh, statements from day one, shall I say, which was around AI and data pipeline management and integration and all the things that I mentioned a bit earlier. But what they also wanted to mention was that it's not all about storage and data. Right? That's only part of the puzzle. What they also wanted to kind of talk about is how we need to ensure that our apps are running reliably, efficiently, and securely against how it is then creating the data and consuming the data. So there was a link back to what NetApp ultimately do as an organization. But what they then went on to talk about was the three investment areas. So they were one, unified and seamless data storage as one area of focus. Secondly, was integrated data services. And thirdly, was cloud operations. So we're going to delve into each one of those now. And I promise you now there will be some announcements and some links to the demos that were put on stage. Well, the unified data storage, which is one of the investment areas that NetApp are focusing on, as I just mentioned. Now, NetApp have been doing um, unified storage since 2002, right, where we consolidated block and file onto the same system. Now, over 20,000 customers uh, are using this functionality from NetApp today. And they've been expanding the portfolio over the last few years to provide any data, any data type, should I say, any workload and any storage type. Simply put, file, object, block, anywhere, on-prem or in any of your three chosen clouds, GCP, AWS, and Azure. And earlier this year, NetApp have also brought out the A150 for the entry-level flash requirements for customers. They then brought out the AFF C-Series, which is the fastest growing um, product in NetApp's history. And then they released the ASA S-Series, so that's S for Sierra, which is an optimized block uh, storage platform, uh, which is cloud and future ready with six nines availability. So announcement number one, ASA C-Series, the dedicated block storage uh, for capacity flash, which provides 70% better energy efficiency and four to one storage efficiency guarantee. So let's see uh, what Harv showed on stage. Today. Yeah, I know, he's just done a big unveil, right? Big black curtain pulled off the physical piece of hardware. Reminded me of an episode of uh, Silicon Valley um, with, uh, with the Belson box release. Uh, but that being said, it was still great for a bit of humor to get everybody brought into seeing the new announcement. Now, announcement number two was how can NetApp aid VMware customers in providing more high availability and disaster recoverability capability? 
So they announced public preview for Snap Mirror Active Sync for VMware, which integrated into the BlueXP disaster recovery platform allows you to create recovery plans to then bring up your workloads in a test environment or in an active failover location to be able to um, keep your business functioning at all times in case of a, a disaster taking place. Now, some of you may already have SRM and various other tools out there. The key thing here is, is this is using the storage layer of replication. And what it's doing then using BlueXP is automating that real-time upbring of the environment as and when it is required. They also have a test functionality. So let's see the test uh, demonstration they put on stage. For your unified data storage on premises and in the cloud. And under the protection menu, we've got a new disaster recovery service that is in public preview. We add some VMware sites to the disaster recovery service. You see two here. One is on premises, and one of them is in AWS. Blue XP Disaster Recovery lets us group virtual machines into Windows and Linux groups or into different application services. We can name them and we can choose the VMware vCenter that these VMs are running on. So let's select all of them for this demo. We then add that resource group and we're going to create a replication plan. We give it a name because we like to name things. And this lets us choose a source and destination view center for where we're going to do our disaster recovery. You see, it, it comes up as a little cloud icon so we know where we're going. All right, let's click next. And we'll select that resource group we created earlier. We also get to do a couple of things. We can use this interface to specify how to map resources from the source to the destination cluster. For example, compute, virtual networks, and also even change the, the settings on our virtual machines in terms of storage and compute. So BlueXP Disaster Recovery does all that for us. We click Next. Would click Next. <laughs> Here we go. We're going we're gonna to set up a replication plan now. OK. So we can also migrate from BlueXP to but today we're going to set up a replication plan, and we want to test our failover. So the best part about BlueXP Disaster Recovery is we can non-disruptively test our failover. So let's do that now. I'm going to put in, a, a, choose the snapshot that I want to replicate from, because I could choose one that's a little older than the most recent. Type in test failover and click on test failover. Right, BlueXP is doing all the hard work for me. It's doing all the heavy lifting. It's setting up our snap relationships and breaking them, cloning a volume and registering and powering on those VMs with those settings that I set earlier. And when I jump into my vSphere client, check it out, all those VMs are right there online ready for me to test my disaster recovery plan. How cool is that? Disaster Recovery and it's available now in public preview so you can check it out yourselves. All right, we'll demo track with a sneak peek into a technology preview. Uh, to best demonstrate this, let's go into a VMware environment that's been set up with Metro Storage Cluster. This lets you stretch VMware clusters across two physical sites and we also need to have a stretch storage cluster. So if we use ONTAP tools for VMware, we can set that up using the SnapMirror Automated Failover Duplex Policy. This is going to create a SnapMirror Active Sync relationship. SnapMirror Active Sync gives you symmetric active active data replication with concurrent read and write to both sites, even when they're in different data centers. That is pretty awesome. Yeah, I heard someone coming. So we can set up our host proximities. This will tell ONTAP which hosts are in which data center to maximize our performance. Uh, and let's take a look at our configuration in vSphere. All right, we can see the storage backends, capacities, which virtual machines are running on them, what kind of storage I have. I've got snapshot protection on all of my VMs, data stores, and I also have ESXi data protection. This extra sphere means I have remote protection for SnapMirror with automated failover duplex or SnapMirror Active Sync. That's pretty cool. All right, but I like to test things, so let's see what this actually does. Here is a VMware environment with two brand new ASAC series with SnapMirror Active Sync replicating between them. I put, brought up a virtual machine on site A on the left hand side with one of my favorite people 
uh, two of my favorite people, in fact, talking about one of my favorite topics, sustainability. You can see this IO going on this VM on site A, and we'll just move this VM over to site to the left-hand side so you can see that site B is pretty quiet. But in fact, this is a stretch storage data store underneath. Okay. So I sent uh, my friend into the data center and they pulled out the cables on site A. So we're going to disconnect the storage on the left hand side and what we want to see is this VM move over non-disruptively to site B, okay? Oh, there it's gone. It's gone red. So obviously it's offline. You see that my network connection to the RDP server disconnects because I'm now moving this VM over to the second site. But the video keeps playing. This VM is still online. It's still running. All of the applications are still going. And you see a little bit of burst I.O. on site B as that VM actually comes up. And this is the power of Snap Mirror Active Sync with that, with that replication between sites. So the best data protection that we have is invisible. It just works. You've seen how simple it can be to set up a complete high availability solution for VMware on NetApp on tap. And SnapMirror ActiveSync is in a technology preview. So if this was an interesting topic to you, make sure to ch chat to your NetApp team or come and say hi to me after the show. So the second investment area was uh, integrated data services. Now for all those FlexPod fans out there, uh, what NetApp and Cisco have released as a third announcement was the introduction of FlexPod cyber secure architecture. Now, some of you are thinking, what the hell is this? Basically, it's a documented framework and guarantee that provides you access to the um, ransomware guarantee services from VMware. Oh, sorry, from uh, NetApp. What this then actually does for you is gives you a, a blueprint to follow for a FlexPod architecture to be as secure as both Cisco and NetApp believe it should be. This is available right now and existing and new customers of FlexPod can take advantage of it. Now, the fourth announcement that I want to talk about is that NetApp are providing uh, some additional security functionality into their ecosystem. So today, NetApp includes things like multi-admin verify and tamper-proof snapshots and, and basically allows you to protect the data destruction from happening when it shouldn't. Now, what they're looking to offer here is with their real-time machine learning AI delivered ransomware protection feature is a way for you to ensure that your data is always recoverable. Now, Harv mentions on stage that he can't see any reason why you cannot recover from a ransomware outbreak by using this feature. He's that confident that he is saying that if you can't, he will back it up with the ransomware guarantee from NetApp that uh, covers you from a financial perspective. Now, one note there is that your systems do have to be implemented or reviewed and assessed for following the policy frameworks by NetApp or an authorized partner uh, to qualify. But if we just ignore that to one side for a moment, what is this actually meaning? So we're thinking about protect. What are NetApp doing to help you protect your data in this instance? Multi-factor admin verify, right? At least two admins saying something needs to be deleted so that no one can delete your snapshots or your backups by mistake. F policy, looking at immutable storage and also tamper-proof snaps. So they're the kind of things that NetApp can provide to protect your data at a high level outside of the traditional kind of uh, snap functionalities that we have. We then have detect, and this is the new piece here, which is the um, AI machine learning real-time detection of ransomware by basically looking at the way that the data um, storage is being utilized across a certain time period. It gives a nice level benchmark. And then if anything from an anomaly perspective starts to take place, it will automatically snapshot with a locked snapshot file um, on your system, on your volume, which then means you can then recover from that if there's a problem which I will show you in a demo in a second. And then the final one then is recover is where it does what I just mentioned there. It creates that uh, tamper-proof snapshot and it also then allows you to recover those files. Now, in some cases, the uh, ransomware may encrypt some of the files 
before the snapshot has finished doing its job, which may mean you lose a small number of files. But you're not actually going to lose them because if you've got your NetApp platform set up properly, it will already have snapshots taken throughout the day you can revert back to for the one or two of files that you're missing. That means that your data loss is very, very small with regards to a time window perspective, if anything at all. Now, one of the things I also want to mention before I show you the demo is that this ransomware protection feature is free to NetApp customers with an ONTAP 1 license. So there's no reason why you can't take advantage of this if you don't already have an ONTAP 1 license. Now, with a caution here, please make sure that you have the relevant um, capacity within your platform to allow you to have this level of snapping taking place because um, the last thing we want you to do is to rely on this and it not take a snap because there is not enough capacity in your platform. So let's just have a look at this demo where uh, NetApp show you how this will function and prevent you from being uh, destroyed by a ransomware attack. And it's on NetApp. We're going to show you autonomous ransomware detection on tap 9.10.1, some of those great layers of protection from ransomware that we've been building in. All right, let's go. Here we are on a desktop of one of my machines. I've got files here. These are probably important files. Um, some marketing stuff, which is not that important, but lots of on tap AI. They're hosted on NSVM on NetApp. So we're going to go into the uh, into Blue XP again. Actually, we're going to have a look at that volume, and we are going to look at our anti-ransomware settings. It's been enabled in learning mode, which happens automatically now after 30 days after it's identified the um, the trends that it sees, what normal behaviour looks like, and we can also manually switch it to active mode when we're ready. But otherwise, on tap is going to do that by itself. Okay. So let's go. It's enabled, we know we're protected, we know that anti-ransomware is scanning constantly for what's going on with, uh, with ONTAP with those files. All right, my friend Jeff Baxter left me a, a little present on my desktop. He said, it's fun, open it for me. And then pay me some Bitcoin. It actually goes through, it's, it's going to encrypt everything. He's, he's written something that encrypts every single file in this share. And I can see it going through there, which is uh, not terribly fun. So we're going to open that file share again and see that it has locked everything with an LCKD extension, which means that I can't open it and I don't know how to unencrypt it. Well, that's no good. <laughs> Let's hop back into Blue XP and see what autonomous ransomware protection in ONTAP has done. Okay, it's identified that there is a potential attack. It's got some red there saying this is a suspected file type. Um, and it's also shown that there's a normal volume activity, which means that something weird has happened on this volume. It's also taken an automatic snapshot, which is this top one up here called anti-ransomware. Oh, that's, that's convenient. I also have other snapshots here that I can I can see, uh, I can restore from. So, um, something we're hearing about more and more is that insider attacks or even people that you know are going to go in there and try and delete your snapshot. So let's do that now, okay. <laughs> but I can't because snapshot copies cannot be deleted with tamper-proof snapshots in ONTAP. You see that they have been locked. It is an illegal operation to even try to delete them as an administrator. That's convenient. That means I can still recover from those snapshots on my primary storage, on my secondary storage, wherever I am I'm taking those backups. All right. So the third part, or the most important part from a ransomware attack is how we recover. We can recover from any of these snapshots, but we're going to recover from the, the top one, the uh, anti-ransomware one. Do that now. And what we're going to do is recover those files in place. So we're going to re just re replace the volume um, and get those files back to where they were before. That's pretty easy with a single click, really, or and, and a confirmation. So let's do that in the paper store, and we'll go back to our desktop now. <coughs> all right, here we are. We can see all those files are back, except there are three. Oh, there are three that were still locked. So I'm going to just quickly recover those from a different snapshot from a little a while ago, like this one. Yeah, and we can also go to these by going into the snapshot directory in our share, so 
This is just like restoring files from a backup. We can go into build a snapshot here. We can find a previous snapshot. We'll copy those three files out that were at the very top of this. And the reason that they were still locked is because ransomware often attacks really fast. It can encrypt things before you notice that that's happening and it actually happened before autonomous ransomware detection picked that up. But because we have those previous snapshots, we can just copy those files back in place. And then with those ones that we encrypted, we'll just toss them out. We could also hold them somewhere to identify whether there is something that we want to look at them and maybe try and reverse engineer some of Jeff's work. But Today we're going to just delete them, we're going to uh, show everything is back, back to normal and I can go and get my morning coffee. So, so the, uh, the fifth announcement. AI! Yay, AI again. Um, but more focus around the data and pipeline management for AI workloads. So on came NVIDIA uh, on stage with NetApp to talk about uh, how NetApp can assist organizations in overcoming some of the challenges with AI um, data pipeline management. Some of the things that they mentioned there are around uh, how AI uses a lot of energy, uh, how AI has massive scale of data challenge and flexibility and agility of data challenges, depending on the AI platform of choice. Um, and then also they, they were kind of talking around that how AI data uh, needs a new approach from a cyber um, threat protection point of view. Um, so what does that actually mean? Um, basically using the NetApp ONTAP AI platform, which is embedded into the, um, the ONTAP operating system ultimately, um, you can get a certified data storage layer for NVIDIA DGX. So the announcement was it is a supported data storage solution and data uh, pipeline management solution for NVIDIA DGX AI solutions. So that was the announcement there. What it actually means for you as a customer looking to do AI with NVIDIA DGX is that you have the integration points with the SNAP functionality, the ransomware protection I mentioned before, um, looking at how you can uh, make that data available on-prem on, uh, on the physical hardware you have in your data center as well as in your three clo chosen cloud providers. So it gives you that flexibility of data locality as well. Um, so the announcement there was that is a certified route for NVIDIA DGX with NetApp on top AI. So to wrap up day two, um, Hyun Song came back on stage to talk about cloud operations, which was the third area of investment from NetApp. The things that she kind of covered really, there was no real announcements here from what I could kind of pick out of the messaging, but it was more around reaffirming NetApp's commitment for customers to leverage the cloud. So InstaCluster um, for open source uh, database services, for example. Um, looking at Cloud Insights for right uh, sizing of workloads for the public cloud and using Spot then for optimization of your workload within the uh, public cloud. Now, if I think about um, the InstaCluster thing for a moment, one of the things that, that Hyan did point out was that using the blueprints and the architectural frameworks with InstaCluster and ONTAP, especially with ANF, so Azure NetApp Files, you can get a three times performance increase compared to not running ANF with InstaCluster at that point. Now, I've not verified those inf that information, but I can give you what I was told on the day. Now, um, the other thing that they, they kind of wrapped up with there was uh, the support for storage grid as a backup target for InstaCluster as well. So let's not forget Storage Grid. Once uh, I had finished wrapping all that up, we had an individual called uh, Daniel Cap from NewBank. Now, NewBank is a, uh, a banking organization based in uh, LATAM, um, providing um, banking services in a region where not a lot of people had access to cost-efficient and secure banking capability. So New Bank set out to ultimately um, provide uh, ease of access of banking capabilities to all of that workforce across all of LATAM. They now have 90 million users using their platform. It's running on Kubernetes across the cloud and it has massive scale as you'd expect at that point to provide that level of access to that number of people. 
Now the key thing here from a NetApp point of view is they've been underpinning a lot of the storage requirements in there as well as the spot elements for optimizing that cloud spend for new bank. They now have their 70% of their workloads covered under spot, driving their cost optimization and efficiencies, which for their organization means they don't have to focus on driving costs down because the platform's doing that for them. So they can focus on driving innovation and new products to market within the regions that they serve. It was a really great story on stage. I probably haven't done it any justice, um, but it was really interesting to see how emotive uh, Daniel was with regards to providing this level of service and capability um, to the people in the LATAM region. And that's the wrap-up for, for day two. So the day three keynote was a, a shorter uh, keynote, um, especially after the uh, evening before was the, the NetApp Insight party where there was a nightclub and lots of music and drink and all those kind of things. So I'm sure they took it light on day three um, for a reason. Now, to, to give you a view here, there was no announcements on day three. Um, so if you're looking for an announcement, you, you can stop here if you want to or you can listen to what comes next. Um, but ultimately, we had a very interesting individual that you wouldn't necessarily have expected to come on stage, and that was Timberland. So not the company that is a designer clothes company, but the music creator and artist that is known as Timberland. And for anybody that um, hasn't seen or heard his music before, um, he likes to integrate technology into the way that he does things, and he talks about that quite openly online. Um, one of the things that he really wanted to talk about was that um, some of the synologies between the music industry and the technology industry when it comes to the way that we consume and utilize data. So he kind of mentioned that uh, a statistic that 68% of, of data is sitting dormant, right, in a lot of our organizations, if not more, if I'm honest, but let's just say 68% is true for now. Imagine the situation where that 68% of the artists that are currently in the industry uh, weren't active anymore. How much smaller would that make the creative world that we listen to on a daily basis? So the key thing here is how do we, how do we ignite that 68% of data? How do we make people use it in a more efficient way, which with the announcements from day two and the overview given on day one's keynotes earlier in this video, you can kind of see how we can get access to that data in a more efficient way, especially with things like Vertex AI, as I mentioned earlier, be able to have a conversation with your data to get an output. Now, Timbaland was very excited around generative AI, right? Generative AI is changing the music and creative industry uh, overnight, right? You can get it to create new songs and lyrics and, and chord progressions and various other things to change the way you're doing things. Now that can be seen as a positive or a negative. Now for me as a guitarist, I like quite like it, right? I can get it to give me um, the chords I need to do a certain um, style of music, or I can give it to, get it to give me certain um, changes in the way that I play my guitar to make it sound more unique potentially. So it's a great assistive aid for someone in the music industry. And the most uh, exciting area for Timberland was how you can use AI for synthesized voice sampling. So how do we change voices and how do we do the pitching levels, reverbs, anything else to bring it into a more consistent manner. So that's the areas he's most um, excited about. And I'm very excited around how it can actually maybe automate some of the editing functionality that goes with creating music and samples. So to summarize the event really, it was, a, it was a great event. It was great to be back face to face for the first NetApp event in a long, long time, since 2019. Um, I feel that the event could have been uh, in Europe, <laughs> selfishly, because I didn't want to have to travel all the way to America for it. But I'm very fortunate I'm actually in Chicago at this moment in time and off to Miami for a Cisco Partner Summit. Now, the key messages from NetApp were all around AI, all around data management and consistency across any cloud, any data storage type requirements. So if you have any more questions or anything you want to learn about from the event, please feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to share an opinion or to give you an insight into anything else that was discussed.